difficult is what takes a little time. The impossible is what takes a little longer. This is a quote I love. It's by Friedhof Nansen, scientist, polar explorer, humanitarian. I learned a lot about him when I was traveling in the Arctic, learning about the Northern Lights. I love this quote because it just tramples all over the word impossible. I think very few things are actually impossible. They just might not be possible now. And in my work, I truly believe that. I work in fusion energy. I work for a company called Tokamak Energy. Now, if any of you have heard of fusion, you may have heard the old joke that fusion is 30 years away and it always will be. For those of you who haven't heard about fusion energy, it's the dream of energy production. Here's the thing. Fusion produces no greenhouse gases, no long-lived radioactive waste, but it would generate huge amounts of energy from almost inexhaustible fuel. It's the reaction that powers the sun and the stars. And since scientists realized what was causing the sun to shine, they've been dreaming about harnessing this reaction to make clean energy for mankind. I first heard about fusion after I just finished studying physics at university. I was on a gap year, traveling, working, and wondering what to do with my life. Back then, just out of university, I was concerned about climate change and what we would do for energy when fossil fuels run out. This was reinforced when I went diving and I saw coral bleaching on the reefs. I hiked in the mountains and learned about glacial retreat. I was seeing science in the landscape. I was still interested in physics. I was still reading scientific magazines. And one day, I read about fusion. Clean, green, safe and abundant. I thought, if we could do this, it would be incredible. It would solve our energy problems. You see, I don't want fossil fuels to run out. I'd like to be able to stop using them. I don't want us to have to drill for oil in the Arctic or other fragile locations. But the world needs energy. Worldwide energy demand is only increasing. And whilst renewables will go some way to filling the gap, they will struggle to supply densely populated areas with high demands and little space. Fusion offers us an alternative. We can do things differently. That's why I decided to do a PhD in fusion energy. Fusion is clean and safe. It produces no greenhouse gases and no long-lived radioactive waste. The fuels for fusion are types of heavy hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. They come together to make helium and a neutron and lots of energy. In fact, fusion produces huge amounts of energy for the weight of fuel. Just one kilogram of fusion fuel produces as much energy as 10 million kilograms of fossil fuels. This means that in a fusion power station, in one day, would be able to use about one kilogram of fuel. That's like a big bag of sugar. Whereas a coal-fired power station every day uses hundreds of truckloads of coal. So that's quite a difference. The fuels for fusion are spread all around the world. And studies have shown that fusion will be competitive with other sources. The thing is, fusion has taken decades of research so far. And some think that fusion will always be an impossible dream. I don't believe that's true, and I want to tell you why. First of all, let me tell you, fusion is really hard to do. We're trying to replicate the sun on Earth. That's like trying to put the sun in a box. This is intense, hostile conditions. It's not dangerous, because if the conditions aren't perfect, then everything stops. But these hostile conditions and the amounts of energy produced means that designing and building a fusion power station is really tricky. So it's going to take time, but we're making progress. I work with machines called tokamaks, like this one here. Now, you're probably wondering where the word tokamak comes from. 
It's quite an unusual word. Well, it's actually a Russian acronym because it was the Russians that came up with the design. It stands for Troidonaya Kamera Magnitnaya Katushka, which <laughs> is a bit of a mouthful, but it actually describes exactly what a tokamak is. It means toroidal chamber magnetic coils. So it's a toroidal or ring donut shaped chamber with magnetic coils around the outside that make a trap for the hot fusion fuel called plasma. Tokamaks have been very successful over the years, and this one here is the best performing in the world so far. It's called JET, and it's located at Cullum in Oxfordshire, which is where I did my PhD. Scientists have done fusion on this machine. They've made real fusion reactions. One thing they haven't done yet is get more energy out of those reactions than they put in. And this is quite important if we want to make a power station. <laughs> Over time, tokamaks have been getting bigger and bigger. This was a logical approach, and I want to show you why. So I've got a little equation for you. This here simply says that the fusion power that we get out depends broadly on three main things. Efficiency of the machine, beta, we call it. Magnetic field strength, B. And the volume of the plasma, or its size. Increasing any of these things will increase the fusion power that we get out. But you can see from the numbers there, the powers, that magnetic field strength has the biggest effect, followed by efficiency, followed by volume. Now, in a conventional tokamak, the efficiency is pretty much fixed, so it's difficult to increase that. The magnetic field strength, that's the most expensive part of the machine, and it's also limited by technology, so it's difficult to increase that. The simplest thing to increase is the volume of the plasma. So tokamaks have been getting bigger and bigger. So going back to JET, JET started operating in 1981, when I was a baby. It's a great machine, and it's enabled some incredible research over its lifetime. The problem is that the fusion community is still waiting for the next machine, ITER. ITER is two or three times as big as JET, and it's an incredible feat of engineering, but it has been politically and bureaucratically challenging, and it's been very delayed. It's currently under construction in the south of France, but it won't start operating until the end of the next decade, by which point I'll be well into my 40s. And ITER won't even be a pilot plant. They'll probably need another, perhaps bigger machine after that. So you can see why they say that fusion is always 30 years away. But this is when it gets interesting. You see, over my lifetime, technologies have changed quite a lot. The mobile phone emerged in my teens, the smartphone in my mid to late 20s. When I was a child, I used to listen to my music on a portable cassette Walkman like this. But ITER was being designed when I was listening to my Walkman. Surely there have been advances in technology that could be incorporated into newer tokamaks. Well, there have been. And in 2013, I started working with a company, Tokamak Energy, who were doing just that. We're aiming to show that fusion energy could be commercially viable by 2030. Tokamak Energy are working with two technologies to develop compact fusion. That is, smaller machines that we can build cheaper and faster. These two technologies are spherical tokamaks and high temperature superconductors. Now, a spherical tokamak is just a squashed up tokamak. So it's rather than having a ring donut shape, it's more like a cord apple in shape. And superconductors, well, they're those cool materials that can levitate. A superconductor has no electrical resistance, which means that it doesn't heat up when a current flows through it, like when you make an electromagnet. Conventional tokamak magnets made from copper will heat up in a minute or so, and then the machine has to stop and let the magnets cool down before it can operate again. But with a superconductor, the magnets wouldn't get hot because the current can flow continuously without heating up. 
So future fusion power stations will need to use superconductors for continuous operation. And in fact, ITER will have uh, superconductor magnets. Now, superconductors only superconduct at very low temperatures, near absolute zero. Conventional superconductors work at about minus 269 degrees C. High temperature superconductors can work at minus 200 degrees C. Now, it's still really cold, but that's a big energy saving. High temperature superconductors also perform better. They can achieve higher magnetic fields and they can take up less space. Why is this important? Well, the combination of these technologies mean that we could design smaller fusion reactors. Let's have a look at that equation from before. If you remember, fusion power scales with efficiency, field strength, and volume. Well, spherical tokamaks have higher efficiency. High temperature superconductors can achieve higher magnetic fields. So if we can increase efficiency and field strength, then we don't need to increase volume so much. We can make smaller tokamaks. Now, we're not talking tiny here. You're not going to be seeing a fusion reactor in your car anytime soon. In fact, a future fusion power station will probably have modules as big as the jet tokamak, but they'll be much easier to build than giant machines. <coughs> this is the Tokamak Energy Development Plan. We aim to use small machines to investigate as much as possible and to develop technology before building a pilot plant to demonstrate electricity generation and to show that fusion could be commercially viable by 2030. This is one of our tokamaks from 2015. This was the first tokamak in the world to have all its magnets made from high temperature superconductors. It was a demonstration of that early magnet technology. We're now working on further high temperature superconductor development to build bigger magnets for high field tokamaks. We also have a new, bigger tokamak called ST40. ST40 will investigate how the plasma behaves in this compact, high field configuration. But we also hope to make fusion temperatures inside this machine. 100 million degrees. That's hotter than the center of the sun, which is only 15 million degrees. This is a scale drawing of SC40. You can see the brown magnets around the outside, and the pink in the middle, that's where the plasma will be. Now, I also have some more pictures of ST40 from the construction phase. So this is the inner vacuum vessel. It's the very center of the machine where the plasma will sit. Then the, magnetics, uh, sorry, the magnetic coils go around the outside. <coughs> These ones are copper, not superconductor. We have currently two parallel development tracks. This is the outer vacuum vessel, which will enclose the whole machine. This is the outer vacuum vessel half on, and again with a, a magnetic coil attached. And then this is a picture of the inside of the machine. You can see the wispy white plasma forming around the coils. It just needs to be pushed into the center. Now the experimental program on ST40 is just beginning. We're studying how the plasma behaves in the compact high field configuration. We're also investigating a novel method of starting up the plasma, and we hope to get fusion temperatures in this machine. If we can do that, it opens up the possibility of compact fusion. If we can make smaller tokamaks, that also opens up the possibility of factory production and easier commercialization. And the modular approach will make uh, the power plant operation more flexible. For me, this is really exciting because we desperately need the fusion solution to our current energy problem. All the work that has gone into JET and ITER means that we have a strong knowledge base on which to build. But I believe that it's emerging technologies that hold the key to commercializing fusion. Tokamak energy physicist Alan Costley, who used to work at ITER, published some research that says that fundamentally, there's nothing in the physics that says that fusion machines have to be huge. 
His papers in the Nuclear Fusion Journal are the most read ever, and you can read them for yourselves online. But just think about that for a minute. Nothing in the physics says that fusion machines have to be huge. The size of the fusion device depends on the approach adopted, on the engineering, and on the technologies available. And technologies always change. Don't you think that's a wonderful thought? It may be that things we think are impossible are just not possible now. If we could do smaller fusion, this opens up the possibility of more efficient marine propulsion. There could be applications in medicine or the hydrogen economy. It could even make interplanetary space travel possible. Now, for space travel, you wouldn't necessarily need a tokamak design. In fact, NASA are funding alternative approaches, such as a direct fusion concept at Princeton Satellite Systems. The potency of fusion means that a fuel pellet the size of a grain of sand could produce the same propellant as a gallon of conventional rocket fuel. So the potential is huge. Fusion may be hard, and it may have taken a long time to get to where we are now. But I don't see that as a reason to give up. Our progress is step by step, like climbing a mountain. Because the difficult takes a little time. The impossible, well, that takes a little longer. Thank you. Thank you.